Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Hey, good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? You know, growing up, I, I grew up Southern Baptist. Some of you knew that, and uh, some of you didn't, so don't hold that against me, okay? Um, I grew up Southern Baptist, and it seemed like every picture of Jesus that I saw was not what we just sang. And maybe you remember those pictures. Maybe you remember growing up. I, I, probably the most famous picture I know of Jesus that I grew up with. He had long flowing hair. He had blonde highlights and blue eyes staring off into the sky. How many of you guys know that, that picture? You know what I'm talking about? Hung in my grandma's home. It's, uh, it's in most churches. I remember after we bought this building uh, years ago, someone actually gave us one of those so that we could hang it up in our hallways. It's not. Um, <laughs> We didn't hang it up. Um, it, 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 there's something about Jesus that we want him to always be gentle and kind, isn't there? Blue eyes. I don't know what blue eyes have to do with that. But anyway, um, uh, you know, long flowing hair, beautiful complexion. I, I can remember back when Desert Storm was taking place in the early 90s, mid 90s, somewhere in there. Is after that, my friend John Randalls, who uh, has gone home to be with the Lord, he, he was talking to a group of students and he said, you know, you've got this picture of Jesus in your mind. And, and yet the reality is, and I'll never forget when he said this, and, and again, around Desert Storm and that, he said, the reality is Jesus probably looks more like Saddam. Hussein than what most pictures you have in your mind. And I remember when he said that, there was like an audible gasp in the room. <gasps> no. <laughs> you know, last week my friend Rick introduced this series called Insta Jesus. We're, we're kind of looking at some snapshots of Jesus. How many of you guys have Instagram? Anybody? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I do. It's one of the few social media platforms that I have because I love fishing, I love guns, and I love my kids. And so uh, my wife posts pictures of my kids, and I love to post pictures of fish. And uh, so uh, I, I love Instagram for that reason. And uh, we follow some nature stuff on there and that kind of stuff. But we're always putting these snapshots up. And, and I think all of us have these snapshots of Jesus in our mind. And, and my friend Rick last week introduced this series by introducing the most foundational picture of Jesus that we could possibly have, and that is Jesus is a lover. It was his love that motivated him towards us. It wasn't us motivating him necessarily, but he was motivated to us because we were sinners. And it's love that what drew him to us and love that, that caused him to leave heaven, unconditionally love us and come to earth and die for us. And three days later, raise from the dead so that you and I could be in a relationship with God the Father, all because of love. And today, we're gonna look at another snapshot of of Jesus. You know, the thing I love about Jesus, he, he was always the guy, and when you go back and read scripture and you, and you kind of pull away from it a little bit and, and, and not read it with maybe your Presbyterian background or Methodist background or non-denominational background or Baptist background, because we all have these filters of denomination and tradition and all that. But when you pull back and you look at Jesus, Jesus was always doing stuff that surprised people. You remember at 12 years old, he surprised his parents by how much knowledge he had in the temple. I don't know. How many of you guys have 12-year-olds? Amen. And, and he's sitting in the temple at 12 years old, and the scripture says he was astonished. He was constantly doing unexpected things. Danielle and I were talking the other night in the garage, and, and we, were, we were just amazed and ama the thinking about who Jesus chose as his disciples. You ever thought about that, really? Crooks? Fishermen? Yes. Yeah. Failures? 
Just ordinary. I mean, he, 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 he chose guys that we probably never would have chose. I mean, he was always surprising. He, you know, think about this. He had time for children. <gasps> he acknowledged women. Whoa. You remember on Palm Sunday, today we celebrate that. He surprised them by weeping and riding on a donkey. That sign of peace. He cleared the temple of the money changers instead of going to the fortress to kick out the Romans. Hello. Can you imagine what they thought? What? Gee, gee, wrong door. And the biggest surprise of them all is he submitted to crucifixion and didn't do anything to stop it. And then if that wasn't enough, he rose from the grave three days later. They didn't expect that. They were up in the upper room. Didn't even, they didn't even know what they were going to do. And then, if that wasn't enough, he surprised them again by going to heaven when they thought they had him back. <laughs> I mean, you step back and you look at Jesus. He was always doing the unexpected. He was surprising them. He was, he, and he was far deeper and more complex than any of them realized. And here's what I'll say this, than any of us realize. <laughs> and see, we know that on a human level. You ever said this about somebody? You know, I just didn't know they had that in them. Yeah. Or how about this? And I didn't see that coming. Just didn't see that coming from them. They really, he really surprised me by that behavior. You see, this is the character of Jesus. Just when you think you know him, just when you think you got Jesus all summed up and you got him in this neat little box on Instagram and you've put this picture up and it's nicely pictured in your mind and you think you know him, then he goes and does something so unexpectedly that we see him in a new light. You see, there's a paradox of God. There's this paradox to, to know that he is consistent, but he's also unpredictable. <laughs> he's consistent in his nature, and you always know where you are with God, but you seldom know what he's about to do. Isn't that amazing? I know that even some of you right now are struggling with that whole statement. What, really? See, you always know where you are with God because he never changes, and our God is consistent, but he's also unpredictable. Because you just really don't know where he's going next. You always know what he's going to be like, but you, you never really know what's next. And then we'll say things, I, I just didn't know God would do that. You ever said that? You ever been to that place where I didn't know Jesus was like that? Or how, 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 may, maybe this, wow. Now that's a revelation. <laughs> See, today I want to look at a face or a snapshot of Jesus that you may not think of, that he was a warrior. That he was a fighter for his people. You know, that may be something you, you're not comfortable with. But remember, love is the foundation. Love is the foundation of everything he does. And so when he wars for us and fights for us and breaks walls down for us or in us or in our relationships, it's not out of anger that he's doing it. It's out of love. Because the love of Christ is the foundation of everything. So I want to give you a couple of pictures of Jesus in, in the future, but then I want to talk about Jesus in the past, and then I want to bring Jesus right here. In Revelation chapter 1, 12 through 18, look at it. It said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned around, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Remember, they referred to Jesus as a son of man. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, and his face like the sun shining in all of his brilliance. And when I saw saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> I just like that statement. Because there ain't a person in this room, if you saw that, you wouldn't do the same thing. Amen? Don't miss this. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. What a picture. What a picture. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. A golden sash across his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool. Wasn't no, wasn't no blonde highlights in that. 
His eyes like blazing fire. His feet were bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice, the sound of a rushing waves. In his right hand, seven stars, his mouth sharp, double-edged sword, the face like sun. You see, this wasn't the Jesus I learned about in Sunday school, amen? This is a Jesus that many of us, <gasps> you see, the Jesus seemed more like a superhero. This is almost like an Avengers, amen? <laughs> Y'all been following the Avengers movie coming out, made more money, and that didn't even come out yet, so made more money. Anyway, uh, when, when I read this stuff, I look at this, because I love Avengers, I love all that kind of Marvel superhero stuff, and I look at this and I go, dude, this would be an awesome superhero movie, amen? Come on now, lighten up. Some of you are worried I'm fixing to go down the prophetic mode and, and go down and talk prophecy. Just relax. I just want you to see Jesus. See, there's so much we can learn from Jesus' patient and serving heart, but we also need a warrior. We need somebody to fight for us. We need somebody that's going to fight for our heart. Someone that's going to defend us. And we see that Jesus is both. He's grace and truth. He's grace and justice. But he's a warrior and a servant. That's the paradox of God. We know who he is, but we never know what he's going to do. Look at Revelation 19. If that wasn't enough, look at this, this, this uh, description. In Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 18, he said, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judge and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name. Look at the, listen to this. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. You think you know everything about God? Did you hear that? When he comes back, he'll have a name that you can't pronounce. That only he knows. Okay, I'm getting too excited about that. Thank you. Verse 13, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, for his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people free and slave, great and small. You think the Bible's boring? <laughs> Did you just hear that? I was reading this this last week and I'm going, hang on, I, I got to go back and read verse 17. Who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God, eat the flesh of uh, kings, generals. <laughs> I look at that and I see that. Jesus is a warrior. Yeah, he's, he's a loving God. He's kind and he's full of grace. But I'm telling you, he's a warrior. The scripture says his eyes were flames of fire. Description occurred twice in the book, but it symbolizes the deep and penetrating insight of the Son of God, that, that suggesting that he is perfectly qualified to judge, that there's something in Jesus that's coming back, that he's going to be able to judge everything in front of him, that all things are naked and laid open before him, is what the scripture is talking about. Upon the Lord's head, it says there are crowns or diadems, and, and there are two words for the crown uh, that we see in this. One is a wreath of victory that you've seen in Greek uh, games. The other is a crown, and it's where Jesus is a picture of a authority of wearing a crown, as we're going to look at next week, that he is the king. He's our king, and he rose from the dead, and that's why he is our king. Amen? But we see this picture of him wearing this crown. It says that he had a name written on him that no one knows but himself. This phrase is obscure when you look at it. We, we, weren't, we won't know his name until he tells us what his name is. And, it's, and there's mysteries associated with Jesus, which we can never fathom. For, for, when people come up to me and go, I've got it all figured out. I, I know everything I need to know about God. Those are the people that scare me. Amen? Because he's coming back and he'll have a name written that, that he only knows. You think you know everything about God. Look at what he's saying says that his garments was dipped in blood. 
It's bapto, supported in the evidence. It's not sprinkled. It's dipped in blood. It's immersed in blood. The blood of those sinners who, who, who flaunted at his will and said, there is no God. God has had his day of vengeance upon him in this passage. That no one was able to deliver the sinners from his hand. That the conquering Christ is followed by the heavenly armies who are also mounted on white horse. And the destruction of the enemy. This is just so cool. It says his, his, out of his mouth came a sword, a sharp sword. That kept on proceeding from his mouth, the illusion of a powerful word. At the time of judgment, here's what's unique about Christ, is he didn't have to wage physical war. His word alone will wipe out all evil once and for all. Amen? In fact, you go back and you study this week in Jesus' life when those legion, that legion of Roman soldiers came to get Jesus. They said at his word, when you study that passage, that at his word, it literally knocked back the whole legion of Roman soldiers. Go study it. His word is powerful. You see, I love these two passages because they're full of teaching and prophecy. And see, I don't want to draw your attention to a bunch of prophecy because we'll all start arguing. Amen? Because you have this opinion and that opinion and all this. But here's what I want you to see. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see the Savior. A picture of him that you may not expect because we love the lamb. We love the peace. We love the grace. We love the fact that he rode in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, not the horse, not a warrior. On his first coming, he had a purpose, and that was the salvation of mankind. Obedience to his father to save us. Therefore, he was gentle and graceful and loving and friendly and all those things we love. And yet when he returns, we see in these passages that he's going to eradicate evil forever. Once and for all. And I'm telling you, the only thing that keeps him from returning right now is his patient love for us and patient love for those who don't know him. And that's the only thing delaying his return right now is that his patient love for us and patient love for those who do not know him. But he's going to come back. See, he's waiting because he wants no one to perish. And when he returns, he's going to come as a warrior. With one purpose, to eradicate sin and evil once and for all. He will break the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. All of it. And see, I want you to see him now. I want you to see him now. In order to see him now, I want to go back to the Old Testament. As I was praying this last week, and Jake was asking me, where are you going with this? What are you going to do with this series? What are you going to do with the warrior Jesus? Because it's not a picture you probably have heard about very often. That's something I didn't hear about very often. I love superhero movies and all that, and Jesus always kind of, the Bible came out on the History Channel, and that war in Jesus, and, and it's like, yeah, okay, but I, I like the gentle Jesus too, right? You see, I was telling Jake this last week, I, I believe God is wanting to tear down some walls, in us. That there's something in him that wants to war for your heart. In Micah chapter 2 in the Old Testament, I want you to see this. You don't have to turn there. If you get, been in, grew up in Bible drill and you can get there really quick, turn there. But if not, look at the screen. There's something prophetic about this passage that's both what's going to happen, but I also believe there's something for us in this for now. He says, I will surely assemble all of you, talking about Israel, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of his pasture. They will be noisy with men. And and, and now look at verse 13. This, This is huge. The breaker. Everybody say breaker. The breaker goes up before them. They break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. So their king goes on before them. Notice who's before. And the Lord at their head. Christ the breaker is found only once in scripture in Micah chapter 2. It's a description of who he is and what he's doing. The breaker actually means he who opens the breach, who goes up before them, that that they break out, they pass through the gate, they go out by it, that there's something that God is doing, that he's going before us. The king goes before them. 
Uh, most writers agree that Micah's prophecy had a partial fulfillment in Judah's return from the Babylonian exile. And the final fulfillment will, will be when he brings us back together in what we just read in the book of Revelation. But listen to me, I think there's some things here for us this morning that we can understand what God wants to do now in our presence. That Micah says our breaker goes before us. So wherever your path leads today, listen to me. You can rest assured that God, the breaker, has already tread that path ahead of you. Thank you, one person. Listen to me. Let me say that again. No matter where you're going today, based on his consistent character, that God has already tread what you're facing. You may be looking at your situation right now going, no, 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 no. Listen, God's already there. He has gone out before us. He has gone out before us to fix our eyes on his face and our ears on his voice. Remember that Christ never drives his sheep. He always leads. Did you hear that? He doesn't drive us. He leads us. There, and there's both a warrior and a lover all in the same, same picture. Like he doesn't drive the sheep. He leads the sheep. Talk about loving. Talk about warring. That he goes out before us. Amen. He breaks our stone heart. Do you know the scripture says that when the Lord created Adam, he gave man his life. When he redeemed him, he gave gave us his own life. That he took a heart of stone and he put that out and he gave us a heart of flesh. That he took our punishment for us. It's amazing to me. I don't know if you saw the movie, The Last Emperor, but that little boy who's the emperor of China was asked, He said this, he asked, what happens when you do wrong? And little boy, the emperor of China replied, when I do wrong, someone else is punished and proceeded to break a costly vase. And when he broke that costly vase, somebody else was punished even though he did it. Listen, God so loved the world that Jesus reversed those roles. Now don't miss this. The king is punished for the subjects. Hello. The king is punished for his subjects, us. Wow. Let me just stop and say that again. Wow. In the Greek, it means wow. (laughs) Come on. I mean, some of you guys need to wake up this morning. I'm telling you. Wow. We serve a warrior king that didn't punish us. He said, no, I'll take it. Come on, church. First Adam broke the law of God. The last Adam, Jesus kept the law of God. And on the cross was broken and brokenness was crushed for our iniquities. He took the punishment. We broke the vase. He took the punishment. (laughs) The breaker was broken. That we might suffer. We might not suffer a broken relationship with God. The breaker was broken for us. You see, Jesus broke the barrier between God and man. Sin separated us from God. He broke the barrier. Even as Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he was preparing the way for a new thing, a new covenant. Mark chapter 11, this week on Palm Sunday, he rides into town and everybody's throwing palm leaves down. Oh, Jesus! Woo! Five days later, they were crucified. Jesus does something incredible that day he rode into town. As he cleared the temple in Mark chapter 11... Today on Palm Sunday, we welcome his king. In just a few days, they execute him as a criminal. But he's a warrior for us, our souls and our lives and our marriages, our children, our our addictions. And that clearing the temple had two implications. Number one, Jesus went into the temple and he saw what was going on, that they were using his temple as a place of business. But not only that, they were ripping off the people that were buying this stuff. And so he began to clear the temple. But there's a prophetic thing that's going on in the clearing of the temple as well, is that Jesus... Jesus was getting ready to do a new thing. And so he came into the temple knowing full well what he was about to do. And he cleaned the temple out so that his spirit could move in. The problem is many people thought it was going to be that physical temple. But what Jesus did is now the spirit lives in us. There was something prophetic in clearing that temple to make way for something new. Listen, God, when he clears you out, he's getting ready to put something new in you. He was tearing down and cleaning out. He was doing a new thing. Listen, I still believe he's tearing down strongholds and cleaning up when we allow him, when we ask him. One of the most profound questions in scripture was that man at the well. 
When Jesus looked at him and he was complaining that somebody else got in front of him, he couldn't get healed. And Jesus asked the most profound question that I think we have in Scripture. Do you want to get well? Do you? Or is it working for you? See, it's working for some of you. And the thought of getting well, you don't know what to do past that. So the question comes in, if he's a stronghold breaker and he's the breaker, then are we willing to allow him to tear down those walls? <laughs> you see, the barrier between God and man when he died on the cross was removed. The veil of the temple, all four gospels wrote about the veil of the temple separating the holy from the natural was rent, was torn so that you and I no longer had to work a system to get to God. It was now Jesus. In fact, the writer of Hebrews interprets the torn veil in Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. He says, we now have confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies. Why? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his broken flesh. You see, he destroyed the barrier between us and God. But our warrior also breaks the barrier between men. That on the cross, Christ was both a binder and a breaker. Look at Ephesians 2. I want you to see this because this is huge. In Christ, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Could everybody say amen. amen. We were once far off. We've now been brought near. Why? Because of the blood of Christ. Not because of what you've done. Not because you're good. Not because you're faithful. Not because you give. Because of Jesus Christ and the blood shed for us. Now look what he says. For he himself is our peace. And that word peace literally means he is our Binding together. He's our a gorilla super glue, okay? Y'all know what that is? He binds us. That word peace is a binding in the Greek. It's binding together that which is broken. So for he himself is our peace and made both Jew, the clean, and Gentile, the unclean, into one. And don't miss this. Having broken down the barrier of the dividing wall. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Through the death and resurrection of the Son, God took the clean and the unclean, and He bound them up. <laughs> he repaired it, He restored it. Did you hear that? He took what they thought could never happen, and He confirmed it. He confirmed it in Acts chapter 10. When he declared not only the food is no longer unclean, he declared the Gentiles were not, no longer unclean by giving them and filling them with the Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. When God does something, it's complete and it's final. Amen? Amen? So he bound them up. The barriers blocked the spread of the gospel. So God set about breaking down those barriers. And listen to me. There are those same barriers in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships that he wants to bind up and repair and restore. He's warring for your family. God showed up through Jesus' sacrifice that he had broken down age-old barriers. And he showed us in just a simple act through Jesus that he wants everyone, every race, every culture, every background to be a part of his faith. See, barriers are like walls. And don't go political on me here, okay? I'm not going to go political on you because some of you right now, you're going, oh, Lord, here he comes. Just relax, Okay? <laughs> Because I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about relationships here, everyday relationships. And by the way, we are way too sophisticated to build a wall in our relationships, a physical wall. I'm going to tell you something. There's actual walls between husbands and wives in this room. Come on. There's some walls between parents and children that you just can't let go. Can't forgive them. Brothers and sisters, employees and employers, between leadership. You see, there's walls that Jesus wants to tear down. And what we'll do is we'll put up invisible walls, not physical walls, because we're way, way, way too good for that, aren't we? And here's how we do it. Oh, I don't trust them. Mm -mm. Or we're just not going to be friendly to them. We're just going to wall them out, aren't we? <laughs> you ever done that? Or, excuse me, let me ask it a different way. You ever been done that way? Because we're not going to admit the other one, are we? 
Or we refuse to forgive someone. Nope, I'm not doing it. You don't get it. I'm done. I'm done. Hmm. Or we just refuse to talk. I'm just going to write them off. I'm just going to go on about my journey. And yet, God wants barriers and strongholds to be knocked down. He's already knocked down all the barriers to a relationship with him. He's already exhibited to us what we're to do for each other. And he knows about those barriers that we've put up. And he wants to break the, down those barriers, to tear down those strongholds. I'm not running for president. <laughs> yeah, amen, babe. We wouldn't make it. <laughs> Too much of a past. Anyway, um, me, I'm talking about me, not you, babe. Welcome, Summit, Facebook. Um, I'm so burdened, I'll, I'll be honest with you, because I think there's some strongholds in our, in our body that our warrior, Jesus, is worn for our hearts, that he wants to tear them down. He wants to break them down. And here's the great thing, is he has the power to do it. <laughs> In fact, you can't do it on your own. Can I just be honest with you? It is God's spirit that breaks down the barriers for us so we don't have to. And it happens when we repent. It happens when we seek his forgiveness and we submit to his lordship. You see, repentance is not a bad word. You grew up with just like I did, some of you, where it was a bad word. Repentance is metanoia. I'm going to keep driving that home until Jesus takes me out of this place. It's metanoia. Change the way you think. Think like God. That's, that's what metanoia is. That's what repentance is. So every day, repentance is a part of my journey. It may not be a part of yours, it's a part of mine, because I don't know about you. I need to get up every morning and repent. Amen? I slept all night. I had bad dreams. I need to repent. Amen? I woke up in a bad mood because my alarm went off. Anybody else got that? Okay? I need to repent right after that alarm goes off. See, repentance is an everyday process. He's our warrior, man. He's the warrior that wants to break down the walls that goes before us, and he's going before you even now, preparing the way for you and I, working in the Spirit for us to follow him, to obey him, to surrender to him. And listen to me, when we surrender to him, see if he doesn't bless you. See if he doesn't prosper you. Because he's our warring king. He's our warring savior. He's already gone before. That thing you're worried about, he's already gone before. That bill you're worried about, he's already gone before. That child you're worried about, he's already gone before. That job you're worrying about, he's already gone before. All you got to do is follow him and pass through and go out. And he's leading you. Amen? That's what it means to surrender to our war and king. Amen. Come on. Amen. <laughs> he's our warrior. He took your heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh, man. You're not who you used to be. I'm going to say that again. Some of you need to hear that. You are not who you used to be. You have now been made new in Christ Jesus. You can't use the excuse, well, hey, I've always been that way. No, you haven't. Because when you surrendered your life to Jesus, bam, baby, you were given a new identity, a new heart. You're not who you used to be. He's the warrior who broke your heart of stone and gave you a new heart of flesh. Amen. He's also the warrior that breaks the barrier between God and us through Jesus and breaks the barrier between men. And with great privilege, Rick said last week, comes great responsibility. The fact that he saved us. You're not who you used to be. You've been given a new heart. That means you can love that person. I'm just going to stop. That means you can forgive them. And forgiveness doesn't mean you have dinner every Monday night at 6 o'clock, okay? I'm, I'm going to let you off the hook on that. But see, some of you, the reason you don't forgive is you're scared to death. You're going to have to go back and be abused. That's not what I'm saying. You can forgive them without entering back into the abuse. That means you can serve that person. That means you can grieve with that person. That also means for you singles, you can wait on the right person. Because you're not who you used to be. You've been made new. 
Oh, but I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Oh, I got to go. No, 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 I can't ever. You've been made new. You see, when you refuse to love and forgive and serve the other person, what you're basically saying is God's not strong enough. And we're saying, in effect, that unforgiveness, unloving, unwillingness is more powerful and therefore becomes your little king versus the real king, Jesus. Come on. Anytime you say you can't, when God says you can, you're replacing him with a little king in your life. We're learning about that in our small group right now. See, many of us have some little kings in this room because we've replaced the king of kings, our warring king, our loving king, our friend king with little kings in our life thinking that they have the power over us when in fact you've been set free from that. Come on. He's our warrior. He's our breaker. He's our savior. You see, what God has called us to is outrageous, impossible, and totally unpredictable, isn't he? To let him be our breaker, our warrior, and our relationship with him and with, and with others in the world, the only way that we can do that is because we are secure in the nature of God, of who he is. He never changes. He never has changed. He never will change. And remember, he is consistent, but he is unpredictable. He will ask you to forgive them. He will ask you to serve them. He will ask you to go tell them. He will ask you to do those things. And he's going to do it at the most unpredictable and, and probably the worst time possible for many of us. But listen, you can trust him because his character never changes you see the church is the opposite we're inconsistent and really predictable and yet we serve a king that surprises us maybe you've been surprised this morning maybe you've got some little kings in your life that you need to repent of to change your mind to turn from predictability and trust in the nature, the loving, warring nature of Jesus Christ. He's warring for your heart. You ever had somebody war for your heart? Fight for your heart, fight for your affection? I just think about us and our journey. My wife, that we fight for each other. We were talking about this the other night. Just in 17 years of marriage, how many times we've had to war for each other. That's what he's doing for you. He's fighting for you. He's warring for you. He is the breaker of strongholds for you. If you'll let him. If you'll let him. To change our mind, to turn and trust in the nature of God, that loving, warring, kingdom, building friend we have in God. Next week... We're going to look at the king. He is our king. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. So, Lord, I thank you that you are unpredictable. <laughs> Just when I think I've got you figured out, and I'd love to say I've quit doing that, but, Lord, you just go and surprise us. Do the unpredictable and God, I know there's some situations in our body and our community right now that, Lord, we don't fully understand. Grieving. The unknown. But God, we know by your character, we know by your word, we know by who you are, the very nature of who you are, that you've already gone before us. And even the walls that are trying to be built right now in people's hearts because of circumstances, Father, I pray that you would be the breaker of those walls. That it wouldn't hinder their spirit. God, I know there's marriages in this room. There's child and parent relationships, employee, employers, maybe just some friends in this room, God, that they built some walls. And they need a breaker this morning. They need a breaker this morning. God, would you give them courage to surrender and repent, to call on your name, the one who breaks and tears down every stronghold. God, maybe this morning that means some of us need to go get prayed over. The power of the spoken word. That we are speaking out, Father, but we're also hearing. God, you would change us. So God, I pray this morning that you would allow us to respond appropriately. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you this morning, because we're going to close the way we closed last week. We're going to take communion. And I want to invite you to respond this morning in a couple of ways. One is, is that you can take communion with your family if you're a believer in this room this morning. That we would invite you to come to the two tables at the front or two tables at the back. Take the bread and take the cup, the body that was broken for us, the breaker that was broken, amen, and was poured out for us, for our salvation, that you would take that and worship him this morning. But as you pray with your family or your group, that you would pray that if there's any strongholds in your life, that God would reveal those to you and begin to tear down those strongholds. By the power and the blood of the broken body of Jesus Christ, that every stronghold will be broken. Maybe this morning you just need prayer. You don't need to take communion. You need to go to Grace Place to your right. There's some folks over there that would absolutely love to pray healing over you. To lead you to Jesus Christ. To pray for restoration for you. Maybe you're just struggling, man, and you just need someone to pray over your marriage. And grab your wife and say, baby, we're going to go pray. We're going to ask them to pray over us to tear down strongholds to tear down those things that are holding us back, to break down those barriers. Be bold today as you respond. So Lord, I pray you'd give courage in this room for those that need it. We're going to worship you by taking communion, responding appropriately. I love you. We ask it in the name of Jesus and everybody said, Julie's going to play. I'm just going to invite you to respond, to take communion. And uh, when you're done, Have a great week, and I will see you next week. You're welcome to hang out, to pray, to uh, minister to each other. Julie's just going to play quietly, and uh, you respond appropriately. Come on. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to... Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.